check my percentages, if I run 100 fish stakes and 52 20s and 50 dog proofs, if I actually figure the percentage, these are my highest percentage catch. These are my 220s are my next highest, and my dog proofs are the last. Maybe I need to learn how to trap coons better with dog proofs or a different bait, but I just think that these are the most highly effective thing. Everyone says late season. I run them day one. We trap the first two weeks of season. Nowadays where they're telling you prime coon, prime coon probably should wait, but your catch will go down. They've been around for a long, long time. It used to be like a stake out in the water, a fish and some grass or some fish oil pullered on. Then Mike Sells was telling us he came up with the fish stake. I originally had a crossbar here and you put the fish on top. I found out the coons tangled up really bad and I did not like the, the damage. So I, uh, I kind of came up with this spinning disc on here and it really helped eliminate the uh, foot damage that I had on the coons. Although, as we all know, they're a, one of our worst animals for self-mutilation. I run 11s. I run double jaws most of the time. These are single, those are double. Um, one and a half coils are fine. My partner used to have a mix, and I had a mix. Well, to make it easier to sort at the end of season without reading trap tags, he gave me his one and a halves, or 11s, and I gave him my one and a halves. We didn't seem to see a lot of difference in uh, in catch one way or the other. You know, one out caught the other one. Fish, I prefer shad. If you can get big shad, I prefer shad. The next thing I use would be carp. Um, everyone says you have to have the head of the carp. I've caught just as many with the tail or the middle. I like the smaller carp. I don't need 28 pounders. I like the smaller carp like this. The difference between shad and carp, shad you can freeze whole and tear with your hands, shove it on here and wire it on. The carp you have to cut into pieces. I found freezing them whole and then running them through a bandsaw and then I count my pieces when I put them in the bags. I will count 30 pieces of fish in a bag. If I'm running 90 fish steaks, I'll thaw three bags out. That way I don't run out of bait during the day or I don't get way too much thawed out. If I know how many pieces are in each bag, I know how many baits I'm carrying with me. I make sure to wire it on. Fish goes on. Like I say, I don't care if it's the middle, the head, the tail. And I wire it on. It's not here. It <laughs> will wire fish on. If you're in a state or a county or a river corridor that you have to have no exposed bait, um, a handful of grass over this and wrap the grass. Maybe pour some lure on it then. I don't use coon lure. Um, I know lure makers don't like that, but all I'm going to use is fish. You can run these about anywhere. I'm going to walk down here in the water if we want to run down there for a minute. Right here running the edge. I'm not going to put this near entanglement. That's what one thing that's really nice about these, you can move them. If the water's coming up, if it's raining a lot, if you went out and pre-dug all your pockets and it just rained six inches before season, I can walk right up here and put my set in just like I would. If the water's falling, I can step back one step and put this back in. I don't run pockets. I, I love these I love these fish steaks. I've run them as far down as I can get them, where it's close to the water. I've had it where I couldn't hardly even push them in, where they've been you're struggling to get the, the trap to set flat, where it was a really hard clay bottom. Both of both of them work. My preference would be about like that. I don't have my rubber gloves on, I should. Yeah. I drop I drop this trap over my foot so I know where it is. I usually wear elbow length gloves more to keep my hands 
clean from handling fish all the time. I'm going to take my knuckle of this to push the loose jaw down. I do not want the loose jaw sticking up. I gang set these heavily. When I mean heavy, I've had up to uh, I've up, had up to five of these underneath the bridge and had seven coons standing there. I don't mind making extra trips up to the truck if I can't carry seven coons. Instead of having seven stops where I caught one coon, I can have one stop where I caught seven. I, I just, I don't understand the, I know I did some of them when I was younger. I set every single spot. I will drive, I keep preaching these 20 coon bridges Oh, 20 coon bridges don't exist, but if you could find 20, 20 coon bridges, you could catch 400 coons, and you'd only have 20 stops. But you have to gang set them. You can't put two sets there unless you run it long season. I'm short season, and then I head south. I've got beaver contracts in Arkansas. Don't get them too close together. Coons will uh, get tangled, but just not so far apart. Another one, another one, another one. Piece of fish, piece of fish. You come back tomorrow and have four coons, five coons, three coons, six coons. You kind of learn. If it's good enough, you never set one unless there's just not enough room. Always put two. When I'm bridge trapping, there's usually a high trail. I would run four of these under a good bridge and I'd run a couple 220s in each high trail. There's a high trail that goes, comes underneath the bridge, goes back, goes down. I run 220s there. Some days you'll find that all the coon will step in the water. Other days you'll find you're catching them all up on the dry. It just I don't know what their preference is. I don't, that's just the coons. You don't think they They, they, they unfriended me. <laughs> I guess, Damn the bad luck. They unfriended me, I guess. But now that I have dog proofs, which when I started doing this, there wasn't any anything much for dog proofs. Now I'll even put a couple dog proofs now on a low trail right here, not too far sometimes, because there you go. Sometimes they just don't seem to want to step in the water. But in general, I mean, like I say, I'd put four right through here. And you come back and have four coons. Take that coon out, reset, fish on, and go. Um, there's almost no fur bearer that we haven't caught in a fish snake. Weasels, uh, gray fox, otherwise I've caught bobcats in these in the south. Bobcat will step in that much water. Coyotes, another reason I have my traps fastened permanently to my uh, discs here is if they pull that out, they can tangle up on the bank with it. Now I have a drag. Sometimes coons will pull them out, sometimes otter will pull them out. If a beaver pulls it out, you're kind of in trouble because usually he goes and you're probably not going to find it. But an otter will usually go on the bank. He won't be too far away, tangled up on the bank. They do catch a lot of otter in these. And if you want to see something go around a circle fast, <laughs> with these, this little spin instead of a crossbar, man, they can go. Fish dakes, fish dakes. Like I say, I like them because they're so adaptable. I don't put them where there's some overhanging limbs or up underneath the bank where there's stuff above because the coon get a hold of something above. You can put these where you don't have entanglement, you know. You might not be able to dig a pocket right there. And I'm not knocking pockets. There's been millions and millions of animals caught with pockets. It's just why I don't use them. But if it starts freezing, I can pull this out and move it over in the riffle. You know, you got a little more, little more current, I can put it in a riffle. How deep of water will you go to set that in? Sometimes if you're, I don't block the backside, that's a good question, I'm going to go with it. I don't block the backside. If I do get fish stolen off these and even wired on, you will get fish stolen. But if you look, read the sign, find out, oh, he came from over here. I might just slide that trap around to this side, wired on. If I keep getting it stolen consistently, I may pull it out and go deeper to make him not be able to feel the bottom quite as well. 
ideally if you could be up shallow here where he was stepping off a bank right into your traps it works really well like I said I've run them I've run them deep I've run them shallow we've had where it flooded overnight and you had coon cod they'd be sitting on this disc you know in the water they're high theft if you put them under a bridge pretty easy to see a fish on a stick underneath the bridge I don't try to hide them if you get traps stolen it's a business expense when you're doing it like that when you're trying to make money sure you're as angry as a nest of hornets I mean if you caught somebody under the next bridge you would want to just but it's a business expense we had one time we lost 32 in a row I got on our line and went bridge to bridge to bridge and just come here and 32 traps right down the line. We caught like 550 coons in 10 days that year. I think we sold them for 18 bucks. You just deducted that as a business expense. They weren't quite as expensive as traps now, but you don't let it ruin your day, I guess. You just go on and do it again. The next year we set the same bridges and didn't have any trouble. I don't know who, who got on it or what happened, but it does happen. Sometimes you'll get fish scales all over the top, especially if you got it fairly shallow, you'll see fish scales. Mink will come up here and eat. Caught a lot of mink by the back foot, by, by the tail, or they come up here and sit down to eat on that fish. It's not a good mink set. If you catch 500 coon, I think that year we caught 40 mink, but we weren't targeting mink. If you want mink rats and coons, pockets, okay, I, but we were strictly coon trapping. We didn't we had 40 muskrats, we had a handful of beaver, we had two otter, two coyotes. Coyotes usually pull them out and they'll be tangled up somewhere on the bank too. I've run them in fast water, slow water, I've run them in mud puddles, up on the land, tire track ruts, although don't set that if you know anybody's going to drive through those because that's not good on tires. <laughs> I, just, I can't say enough good about them. A lot of you know Mike Cope online. Mike and I trap under the same bridges. We met there. We're really, really good friends. He would put a, a slap and go set on each end of a bridge above him. Smear some fish in a trap and a drowned wire. Put one over there. I actually, to test the deal, went in between him and put two fish sticks. So he's got me cut off upstream and downstream and we caught more with this set than with the ground fish and the slide wire. He caught coons, but we we caught more than he did, putting him, letting him cut me off, you know. They're just deadly. You will have lots of doubles. If you have mixed doubles, if it's a muskrat, the coon usually has him shredded. If it's a mink, it's not too good a shape. Two coon, usually they're just sitting there. I'm not sure, I haven't put a video camera on these, I'm not sure if one coon gets caught and he just backs to the end of the chain and sits there in another one, or if it's brothers running shoulder to shoulder and you catch two at once, you do catch a ton of doubles. Like I say, I had five under these under the Skunk River Bridge, had two, 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 one, and the other traps were messed up and I'd missed. You got towed or just plain flipped the traps messing around, but I had seven coon out of ten traps, you know, all doubles. You catch a little coon, I don't believe that. The longer you run your coon line, years I'm talking, seasons. Every season your line gets healthier. The first year under some of these bridges you'll catch a lot of those little bitty dinks. Two or three years in your coon population, you thin them down a little bit, they're a healthier population to catch bigger and bigger ones. We'll have doubles on 25 pounders. I mean it's not uncommon at all. Now that I haven't run my normal line for six, eight, ten years, I would anticipate catching a lot of because they're going to be overpopulated in those areas. But the longer you run your line, the healthier it gets, the bigger the size of the coon gets. Because of inbreeding? I just, the population, I think. You just get your population down. I do not release small coon. Um, I believe that if they make it through winter, I think you're doing that little bitty coon a favor if you dispatch him. If, you, if he makes it through winter and doesn't starve or get disease, He's going to breed late, he's going to have a litter late, and you're going to have 
littler ones next fall to catch. If you get rid of those, get your population healthier, then your coon size gets bigger. I mean, they, I, like I say, we start these day one of season. Sure, they're great late season deal, but they're deadly early season. And as the weather changes, like I say, if it's raining, you can move them up. If the water's falling. If it's freezing, you can go over to the riffles. If there's entanglement where you'd like to put your perfect pocket or blind set, you just move over. I try to put it where the coon's at in front of his face. If there's a trail coming down, the cooner coming down this trail to the water, yeah, I'm going to put one right in front of his face and move it. Narrow streams, if you got narrow streams and you see the cooner walking down the bottom, and I put four of these in, the upper one and the lower one, I'll have the traps upstream and downstream instead of to the bank. This was only three feet wide. I'd, uh, if this was my upper one, I'd have a trap upstream and I'd have a trap probably downstream or maybe both, maybe both up, I guess. Both upstream like this. This one I'd have one on each side, the next one I'd have one on each side, and the bottom one I'd have two facing downstream, especially on the real narrow where you can see coon tracks where they're walking down the bottom. But with it wired on, they have to stomp around and play with it. Questions? I say I don't I don't lure, I don't that chunk of fish is just the coon can't not resist he can't resist it. He has to come. Sometimes you get a fish that's eaten off of one. This is a strange observation. You have three or four of these and you look off the bridge. When you're when you're long lining and trying to do this as fast as you can, a lot of times you look off the bridge if you can see your sets tuck them underneath early season maybe move them out just a little bit later on but um, that one doesn't have any fish on it if you're in a hurry you should go down and bait it but we've left that without fish on it and came back the next day and had coon caught there now do they come right back to that exact spot and they ignore this fish again I don't have a hotline to the coon but it'd be strange you'd have two and like oh we'll bait it tomorrow you know we'll have more time and you'll have a coon in that one that did not have any bait on it. So is that the coon that got it and he came back and he's fishing around trying to see if there's another piece? I don't know. But These are my highest percentage. If I was going to trap coon this fall, we'll run a few of these with the grandkids, but if I was going to long line coon this fall, this would be my, I'd do about a hundred of these. A hundred of these will keep you hopping. Um, if I haven't caught a coon in three days, unless it's really weird weather, um, I'm going to move it. It's in the wrong place. We, we were picking spots where we would catch a coon every day consistently. You don't want three of these under a bridge waiting for a week or two weeks to catch a coon. That wasn't what we were doing. We were 14 days to kill as many as we possibly could. We skinned and gutted and bagged everything we caught because we had a carcass market. I still do, actually. but. We skin gutted and bagged all our coons, which you start catching 80, 90, 100. We broke 100 twice, partner and I. No pre-staking, or if we did pre-stake, we'd pre-stake on Friday. But I was driving 200 miles, 150 to 200 miles, and hitting just the good spots. I skipped all the mediocre trails. Hot trails, yeah, we'd have four 220s in it if it was, you know, legal to set four 220s there. But I would skip all the mediocre spots. I want those 20 coon bridges. But you can't just set two traps and expect to catch 20 coons in two weeks. I don't roll my trap tags. But if you have too small a disc on these, you're down there. <laughs> anyway, if you have too small a disc and you use a one and a half coil, it will get over this and it'll get over the disc and your trap will be down here and you have no swiveling and you'll lose your coon. I mean, you're, you're not doing the coon any favors. He's going to damage him, his foot. So that's why these discs are so big. Um, I use stock chain. An extra swivel wouldn't hurt, but I've got swiveling here and I've got swiveling here. Some of my uh, 
all these other traps have swivels on the bottom. These are, I think these are Sleepy Creeks. They got a swivel off the bottom. A swivel there. A super weak 11 seems like a hole just about anything. Like I say, these are one of the hardest traps to get yourself out of because you can't break with your thumb in there. You can't break this side down. <laughs> one and a half coil, you can get your heel or your hand on it just enough to get yourself out. But 11 is just... I've heard they're good otter traps. They used them for transport or transplanting otters. I weld two, I weld two discs solid to the stake and I let this so it spins. I had a lot less damage on my coons and they, uh, they don't tangle your chains up so bad. With a crossbar, they will tangle the chains. You swear they took knitting lessons. I've swore I've had to open this rivet to get the traps untangled with a T-bar here. They'd get through and around. They'd get this one through and around, and I don't know how they did it, but you're in a hurry and you want to go because you know you got, you know, 20 more stops or 30 more stops, and man, you just want to.